from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Castle of Horrors Russian castle in the Isle of Man was formerly the palace of the kings of Man, and until 1890 was the island's prison. More strange stories are told of Russian than probably any castle in Britain particularly about some of its unfrequented rooms. One such story is this. A young member of the castle staff had just finished the work he had to do on one of the occupied rooms of the castle, when to his surprise he saw a very pretty girl standing in the doorway. She was in the white garment of quaint old world design. Wondering who she was, he was staring at her when she smiled and beckoned to him to follow her. Feeling compelled by some irresistible force to obey her, he followed her as she walked into the unoccupied portion of the castle. Through empty room after room she went, never pausing until she came to the last of the rooms where a strange impressive silence reigned. In the center of the room was an antique four-poster bed with a curtain drawn around it. The girl smiled archly at the young man as she deftly drew aside the curtain. What he saw gave him a fearful shock. Squatting on the bed was a nude figure with long arms and legs. The face of the thing was neither human nor animal, but a hair-raising mixture of both, together with some nightmarishly evil aspects. For some moments the young man stood staring at it petrified, then he collapsed and fainted. On gradually recovering consciousness, it was some long seconds before he ventured to open his eyes wide. When at last he did so and glanced around him, the room was empty. The girl and the terrifying thing on the bed were no longer visible. He scrambled to his feet, and ran to the occupied part of the castle, never daring to go into the empty rooms again unless someone was with him. A second story tells of a Welshman named Evans from Cardiff, who visiting Russian castle one day wandered into one of the unoccupied rooms, where the only furniture was a single chair. Although he could see no one, Evans had a feeling that he was not alone in the room. Whenever he moved, he was followed by a curious eerie sound like a gasp as if someone was in pain or out of breath. He did not believe in ghosts, but was forced to think there was something very queer about the room. When Tyre was strolling around, he sat down in the chair. He found to his utter horror that it was already occupied by something cold, slimy, and loathsome. With a wild cry of terror, he sprang up and rushed out of the room, and it was with some effort that he later found the courage to describe his experience. The subterranean passage believed to be under the castle also has its story. It is said that a London man on holiday in the Isle of Man, hearing about the mysterious passage, asked permission to venture in it, which was given. There was no electric torches then, and he entered the narrow, winding passage, armed with a lantern, matches, and candles. After threading his way along it for some considerable distance, he at last saw a light ahead. The passage became wider as he reached the end, and he saw that on the far side of an open space was an illuminated mansion. He walked towards it, and on reaching it, rang the bell. The door was opened by a man in livery who asked if he wanted to see the master of the house. He replied that he did, and the man admitted him. He was then conducted across a spacious hall to a room, leading out of it, and opening the door of this room, the servant signed him to enter. He stepped over the threshold and abruptly halted, for seated at the table was a frightful monster. Recoiling from its malicious gaze, he turned and fled the house in terror, and did not stop running till he was out of the subterranean passage. As a prison, Russian castle gave rise to many other strange stories, such as the evening when two officials, glancing idly out of one of the windows, saw a procession of headless phantoms slowly cross the prison yard. One well-documented incident occurred on the day a woman criminal was executed in the castle grounds. Hours after the execution, an official was standing on duty on the main entrance of the castle 
when a woman in black suddenly appeared, seeming to rise out of the ground and approach him. When close to him, she lifted the veil covering her face. He saw to his horror that it was the woman who had been hanged that morning. She vanished as suddenly and inexplicably as she had come. The same woman in black was subsequently seen by several others of the prison staff. Phantom Hand in the Jungle The following strange adventure befell my great-grandfather, Colonel John O'Donnell, while he was paymaster general to the forces of Oud in northern India with the rank of captain. He had been all day in the great jungle to the north of Oud, without catching as much as a glimpse of any of the bigger game, although he had been told they simply swarmed there, and he and Ali, his favorite shikari, were both weary and disgusted. They thought sadly of what Captain Huggins and his party, who had gone off elsewhere, would be saying when they returned in triumph to their bungalows with perhaps two or three tiger skins, against their own poor bag of a few antelope and a samper deer. For hours, Captain John and Ali had been tramping along a very rough track full of ruts and holes and overgrown in places with clumps of interlacing creepers and trailers and long thorny canes, whose hook-shaped prickles inflicted ugly wounds in the flesh. At last, to their relief, they emerged into the broad arena intersected by a stream, the gentle babbling of which made pleasant music in their ears. Facing them on the far side of the stream was a natural avenue composed of huge sal, sisu tun, and other trees. It had a curiously cultivated appearance amid so much that was primeval, and Captain John's interest was aroused. He loved flowers too, and the rare creepers all ablaze with them, that wound themselves in rich leafy masses round three tree trunks and the parasite orchids of the most brilliant hues nestling in the roots of old trees strongly appealed to him. He told Ali that he intended taking a stroll in his wild garden while the shikari was having a fire lit and supper prepared. Please, Sahib, please don't go in there, Ali exclaimed excitedly. Captain John looked at him in amazement and saw that the shikari was trembling. Why not? What the devil's the matter with you, he snapped. Nothing, nothing, Sahib, Ali stammered, but that avenue... It is cursed. Captain John laughed. It is haunted, Sahib. Ali insisted. I saw just now. I saw. Yes? What did you see? Captain John laughed again. A hyena? I thought I spotted one myself. Ali shook his head solemnly. It was neither human nor animal, he said gravely. It was an evil spirit, and it was under one of those sisu trees, and he not in the direction of the avenue. As you value your life and soul, Sahib, let me pray you not to go there at night. Captain John laughed all the louder at this, and despite Ali's warning, he set off at once to the avenue. You remain here, Ali, he said, and be sure to get us up a good meal. Meeting that spirit of yours will make me ravenously hungry. The United Provinces of Oud and Agra in those days, especially in the extreme north, boasted of many a wild and savage spot and as Captain John, musket in hand, strode resolutely forward, the sun had long since set, and the jungle sounds, which might have awakened far and near, now fell on his ears, as if the authors were abundant all around, in spite of their quietude all day. He gazed admiringly all around him and up at the ultramarine starlit sky. He cared nothing for lurking dangers. All he wanted at that moment was to explore the avenue in front of him. Suddenly, through the foliage to his right burst a face. He could not help starting. It was so unexpected. Then he became intensely interested. The face was that of a Chinese girl, with black hair cut in a straight fringe across the forehead, eyes like sloes and a rosy cupid bow mouth. She smiled archly at him and beckoned to him with a dream of a slender hand on a tapering finger, of which gleamed a jeweled ring. Captain John in those days was a bachelor, and like most Irishmen, very susceptible to the charms of the fair sex. The Chinese girl fascinated him enormously, and oblivious to Ali and his supper, he at once set off in her path. On and on she led him, every now and then turning round and beckoning to him with the same mysterious smile till she finally came to a long and high palisade in the center of which was a big wooden door opening this door she again signaled to captain john to follow and then passed out of sight 
He hurried after her, but when he crossed the threshold of the palisade, she had gone. He found himself in a wide courtyard, the gloom and solitude of which was overbearing. Everywhere was advanced decay and desolation, dead leaves, rank weeds, and moss-covered stones. Fronting him on the outskirts of all stood a low, rambling bungalow with a veranda all around it. There was no sign of life anywhere, saving the bats, mosquitoes, and fireflies that came too near to be pleasant. Led on by an impulse he could not control, he made for the building and swinging back a door, which groaned on its rust-worn hinges, entered the premises. He was in a spacious hall, into which opened many doors. The floor was covered with thick dust, showing the tracks of innumerable small animals and insects, but no marks of humans. It was clear, therefore, that the Chinese girl had not entered the place. Where, then, could she have gone? It was a puzzle that stirred uneasy fancies in his mind, but he pressed forward. On one side of him was a half-open doorway, through which he could catch the glimmer of water. He made for this, calling out as he went, Hello? Is anyone here? There was no response. Only an emphatic silence that had something unpleasantly disturbing about it. Was Ali right after all? Was the place haunted? Still he went on, all his pulses throbbing. The door he was making for led into a large room, at the far end of which were French windows. He opened them and stepped out on a terrace which immediately overlooked an artificial lake, the edges of which were fringed with rank weeds and tall rushes. A night bird in one of the trees on the far side of the lake wailed ominously and Captain John was still listening to its echoes when there was a slight eddying of the water just below him and a hand suddenly rose above the surface and gripped frantically in the air. The moonlight being very strong, he was able to see the hand with the utmost distinctness. It was slim and white, with tapering fingers at the ends of which gleamed very long, almond-shaped nails. He had only seen one hand as beautiful, and that was the hand of the mysterious Chinese girl he had followed. To make the likeness more complete, on one of the fingers was a ring, the jewels in which flashed and sparkled as they caught the moonbeams. The hand remained above the water for some seconds and then sank beneath the surface. Almost simultaneously, just at his elbow, came a chuckle, loud and diabolical. He swung round, cold with terror, but saw no one, only the wooden walls of the bungalow, with the dark shadows of the distant trees, waving very gently on their white surface. More nerve-shaken than he had ever been in his life, Captain John re-entered the building. The staircase leading in one straight flight to the landing overhead fascinated him. It was so still and solitary, with strange shadows blackening its grimy, dust-laden boards. He felt he must ascend it. He was about halfway up when he paused. Coming towards him across the landing were the sounds of footsteps. He deduced from them that some slight, agile person, a woman, was in flight, pursued by one or two men. He sensed terror. Just as the foremost steps reached the head of the staircase, the other steps caught them up. There was a fearful scream that made his heart stand still with sheer horror, and then silence. <coughs> For some seconds, he was too appalled to move. He just stayed there on the stairs, paralyzed. When his faculties at last reasserted themselves, he turned and ran. Fortunately, the door leading into the courtyard was, as he had left it, wide open, and as he neared it, he heard hard footsteps bounding over the hard floor after him. Fear gave him additional speed. He was naturally a good sprinter, and he got safely through the courtyard and out into the avenue beyond. Not once did he pause till he reached the campfire and a lee. When he rejoined Captain Huggins several days later and told him of a strange adventure, Mr. Vandergout, a Dutch merchant was one of the members of Huggins' hunting party remarked. Oh, I know that house in the avenue. I often used to pass near it when I was living in that part of the country. The tradition is that a Frenchman, Bonivon or some such name, was murdered there, and suspicion falling on his very young and attractive Chinese mistress. She was seized by certain of his relatives and friends and hurled into the lake you mention, where some crocodiles made short work of her. Ever since then, the house and avenue have borne the reputation of being haunted. Haunted Churches Near London 
The deanery at Windsor Castle possesses a very well-authenticated ghost. It is frequently heard walking along a passage, opening a door and descending four stairs with three distinct steps. A lady who visited the deanery comparatively recently and heard nothing of the ghost told the occupants of the house that the passage was haunted by a figure in gray, too vague and shadowy, however, for her to determine whether it was a phantom of a man or woman. The cloisters adjoining the deanery are believed to be haunted and by a ghost bearing a striking resemblance to the portrait of Henry VIII in the National Portrait Gallery. It is occasionally seen, but more often heard, perambulating the dean and canon's cloisters, groaning and moaning as if in direst anguish. If it really is the earthbound spirit of Henry VIII, one cannot be surprised or help being somewhat satisfied that such a monster as the bluff monarch should be doomed to some kind of lasting punishment for his many cruelties. The churchyard of South Mims is well known to be haunted by a woman in white, the ghost of a lady who was murdered in the adjoining vicarage by some of the most ruffinly soldiers of Cromwell's army. It seems that sometime this woman in white haunts the vicarage too. Some years ago I interviewed the then vicar of South Mims who told me that although he had never actually seen the ghost, he had been definitely conscious of its near proximity, especially in the early hours of the morning. He was sure it was beneficent and not evil. He told the same story to a representative of the Daily Chronicle, whose account of it was published in a subsequent issue of the paper. Apparently, he also told this reporter that one of his parishioners, on entering the church alone one day, saw a clergyman kneeling at the priest stall in the chancel. She did not notice anything unusual about him at first, but when he got up and passed through a closed door leading to the vestry, she at once realized that he was not a material being, but a ghost. The description she gave of him exactly fitted a former vicar of the church, whom she had never met, and it transpired that on the same day and just about the same hour that she had seen the ghost, the former vicar had died. The vicar of South Mims also told me he had once seen something of a ghostly nature at the wash, a strip of wasteland, a few minutes' walk from the church, running alongside the high road between South Mims and London, adding that not only he but other people had seen it too. From other sources I learned that in addition to this ghostly something seen there, the wash and its environments, including the South Mims churchyard, are reputed to be at times haunted by the ghost of the notorious highwayman Dick Turpin. He used to sally forth from the wash to hold up travelers on the Old North Road, which, in his day, was the great highway to the north. It was hearing these stories about the hauntings of the churchyard and wash that led me to spend an all-night vigil at South Mims in the hope of witnessing some of the phenomena. The South Mims church clock was solemnly booming midnight when I arrived at the churchyard and as I passed by the railing that skirted it, I was conscious of something coming through them and moving along beside me. My own shadow stood out clear and black on the moonlit soil, but only mine. Whatever was with me cast no shadow. I went by the Middlesex Arms and turned down the asphalted lane leading to the South Mims Wash, and all the way I felt my silent, invisible companion was with me. After leaving on my right a quaint little farmhouse outside, which in the daytime horses graze, ducks waddle, and geese cackle, I found myself alongside a track of wasteland through which a stream rather sluggishly made its winding way. On the far side of the wasteland were hedges and beyond fields. On all sides isolated trees stood out against the moonlit background of sky. This was the Wash, a rural spot despite its proximity to a great artery of London. Continuing along the deserted moonlit lane, I crossed a stone bridge and came within sight of a very rustic wooden bridge with dense foliage on one side of it and wire fencing bordering fields on the other side. Here I halted and standing on the bridge rested against one of its railings. Old times came vividly back to me. Once again I was a private in the United Arts doing sentry duty by night on Grosner Railway Bridge during the war and I thought with longing of the hot coffee and bacon with which we had used to regal ourselves in the guard room. I thought too of some things not quite so pleasant, of the white lady ghost rumored to walk about at night in the South Mims churchyard, and wonder if she was the silent, invisible companion I sensed was still close to me. My thoughts reverted also to Gill Hill, the scene of the horrible where murder 
and said to be still haunted by the ghost of Ware and his murderers, Thurtell and Probert, to Chestnut's old manor house, wherein Mrs. Chapman, whose husband, the well-known publisher and brother-in-law of Mr. and Mrs. Charles Keene, had so many harrowing ghostly experiences, and to Enfield, with its house of sighs and clanging armor ghosts, popularly believed to be that of one of the Demandevilles. Some of these places were not very near, it is true, but as distance counts for little with denizens of the other world, they were near enough not to be pleasant. A chilliness in the air made me put on my overcoat, and as I did so, I was suddenly conscious that my companion from the churchyard was no longer with me. I was now alone. Every now and then, from the high road and roads more distant, came the sound of traffic, hootings, whistlings, rumblings, occasionally bat skim in noiseless flight in and out of trees and bushes, night birds wailed and dogs bayed the moon. In the shallow water beneath me, tiny dark forms darted hither and thither, every now and then to some small animal, maybe a stoat or rat, rustled through the weeds and long grass, otherwise stillness and not a human being in sight anywhere. To me, there's always a something rather eerie in a deserted moonlit road or lane, and as I guessed at the whitened empty lane confronting me, and at the shadows of the trees that flecked it here and there, I was conscious of an intense concentration all around me. I felt all nature was expecting something to happen, and that very shortly something alarming would burst into view. Then suddenly, the horses and cattle, which had been standing dumb and motionless in the distant fields, began to race about madly as if panicked. Birds from the foliage near me flew away with startled cry and much rustling of wings. I looked around apprehensively and saw hovering over a spot by the roadside a swarm of flies that in the uncertain light looked curiously black and large and nasty. When I approached them to see what was the attraction, they mysteriously disappeared to reappear directly as I moved away. So far as I could see, there was nothing to account for their presence, a feeling of intense repulsion and not a little horror seizing me. I left the spot and hurriedly and retraced my steps to the distant stone bridge. I was within a few yards of it when I saw coming towards me over the moon whitened soil a black shadow, a shadow something like that of a man, but not altogether like and something like that of an animal, but again, not altogether like. A very alarming shadow because it was so ultra-grotesque and frightfully suggestive of evil. I glanced around to discover its origin and failed utterly. It was not due to a cloud because no clouds were in the sky. There were trees near the lane and their shadows certainly did sway to and fro in the night breeze, but they did not move along as did this shadow. There was no apparent physical counterpart to it, and a very unpleasant atmosphere accompanied it. When it was close to me, I experienced again the feeling of horror that had gripped me at the fly-ridden spot, and I walked back in the direction of the wooden bridge. Instinctively, I knew I was being followed by the shadow, and every time I looked around, there it was, a few yards in my rear. No matter how fast I walked, and at times I almost ran, it maintained the same distance from me, seemingly without increasing its pace. When I was close to the wooden bridge, I saw the flies. They were still hovering around the same spot. And again, a feeling of intense horror and repulsion obsessed me. I felt the spot was accursed, and something foul and strangely horrible was lying there. I walked quickly on and then looked around. The shadow had come to a halt at the spot around which the flies hovered, and as I gazed at both shadow and flies, I was conscious of a shuddering sound, as of suppressed dread close beside me. The next moment shadow and flies abruptly vanished, and all I saw at that spot was just moonlight and whitened soil. Directly this happened, I felt my invisible companion had rejoined me, and his feeling continued till we came to the churchyard, when I as suddenly sensed that the unseen presence had gone, and that I was now quite alone. I have found that many people are most reluctant to talk of ghosts that haunt the town, village, or neighborhood in which they live, and I attribute their reluctance chiefly to a fear of ridicule. They still cling perhaps to the notion, at one time very prevalent, that it is only rustics and ignorant peasants who believe in ghosts. However, that notion no longer prevails. 
On the contrary, the reverse would seem to hold good, and today speaking generally, it is the more highly educated people who, far from scoffing at those who believe in psychic phenomena, take their beliefs seriously, even if they cannot agree with it. As a rule, it is now only the uneducated or hopelessly ignorant person who laughs derisively when one speaks of the superphysical. I certainly found the rustics at South Mims very reluctant to tell me anything about the wash, and it was not until I approached and sounded a dozen or more of them that I met at last with an old roadman who was not afraid to talk. You didn't see the ghost of Dick Turpin, he remarked, when I told him the primary reason for my all-night vigil at the wash. Nobody I've come across ever has seen him, but those flies in that shadow you speak of, they're different. He then went on to tell me that his father, who had been dead many years, used to talk about getting a queer feeling every time he passed the churchyard at night, as if the spirits of some of those who lay buried there were standing at the railings peering at him and of being occasionally followed by one or more of them, always in the direction of the wash. His father also used to speak about an old woman living near the wash when he was a boy who, it was said, called up evil spirits. She was found dead one morning at the wash. Some thought that she had been murdered, but there was nothing to prove it. Anyway, being a witch, the parson wouldn't have her buried in the churchyard, and so she was buried at the crossroads near the wash, with a stake driven through her body to keep her spirit from wandering about. In spite of these precautions, the old road man continued, people said they saw a shadow, just as she described, following them along the road, leading to the wash at night. Some thought it was the spirit of the old witch, and others one of her imps. But whichever or whatever it was, it always came to a stop at the spot where the body of the old woman was found. And folks declared, too, that at this spot, as if waiting for the shadow, were a swarm of nasty-looking black flies that disappeared suddenly with the shadow, in the mysterious manner you describe. But, he added, it doesn't happen every night, only just now and then. He went on to tell me about some experience he had in South Mims churchyard. He said that some time after one of the very old tombs had undergone repairs and renovations, he had seen a gruesome, leadenish blue light hovering around the spot, and nothing would induce his dog to go near it. When, however, the light no longer appeared there, his dog would approach the tomb quite happily. I published an account of my nocturnal experiences at South Mims in the Sunday Pictorial, and received a letter from a reader living in a suburb of Birmingham, expressing great interest in my narrative and stating that he also had had a ghostly experience at the wash. The following is an ad verbum extract from his letter. Nearly 50 years ago, I was then between 13 and 14 years of age. I was staying with an uncle at High Barnett together with a cousin a little older than myself. He and I were great chums, certainly not good boys. In fact, we were known as two little devils who would come to a bad end, always in some scrape or other and without fear of anything. My uncle's business took him driving into the surrounding country, and we would often walk a few miles out to meet him and to get a ride home. One evening, we walked to a place called South Mims. Uncle had not yet arrived, and we proceeded to have a ramble round. It was a late autumn evening, and as we walked along, with the flies surrounding us, there was certainly nothing to worry us or to give warning of the few minutes of really terrifying experience we were to go through. First, the feeling that everything around us stood still, a feeling that something was happening near us that we could not see. I remember we both stood still, neither speaking, the cold feeling of my hair literally standing on end, just two boys spellbound, then the horror of something weird and unearthly that appeared to rise from the very ground and still no sound at all, just dead silence as this thing, which was neither human nor animal, seemed to come towards us. Suddenly one of us let out a scream. We were never able to decide which of us it was, which brought us to life and we ran home, forgetting all about our ride, in our haste to get there. We were so scared. But we got no sympathy, only each a good hiding for letting our imagination run away with us. It was, however, no imagination. It was true and terrifying, but very hard for two young boys to get anyone to believe. Apart from the tradition concerning the mysterious death of the reputed witch, in more recent years there have been at least two sinister mysteries that might well be productive of hauntings. 
The first occurred in 1861 when the body of an unknown woman was found in a ditch in a field near the wash. She was thought to have been employed haymaking by a local farmer, but her face was too gnawed by rats and other vermin for identification to be possible. Cries had been heard coming from the field one night, but whether they were her cries or not was never known. An open verdict was returned. The second mystery occurred in 1930 when the body of an old tramp was found also in a field near the wash. Though a verdict of death from natural causes was returned, there was grave suspicion of foul play. After the second mystery, tramps gave the wash a very wide berth at night for some considerable time. Only a few weeks ago, I commented on this to a tramp whom I saw one morning lying on the ground near the wooden bridge, and he said, I'll never sleep out here again, Governor. What, with the queer noises from that bit of swampy ground, with its weeds and waters, and the things I didn't see, but could feel hovering over me and around me all the time. It's far too uncanny for my liking. Talk about haunted places. This place is haunted all right, and so is the churchyard nearer. I tried sleeping there one night a year or two ago, but never again, Governor, not if I knows it. A few miles from Hitchin, in a wood on the summit of a hill, are the ruins of Minsden Church, at one time a chapel of ease, said to have given shelter to many a passing pilgrim. Tradition associates it with Alice Pears, mistress of Edward III and Lady of Hitchin Manor, who was credited with stealing her royal lover's rings when he was on his deathbed and powerless to prevent her. In the 17th century, it witnessed the marriage of Sir John Barrington Bart to Susan Draper. After that time, nothing of any note seems to have happened there, and about 1738, it became so dilapidated that pieces of masonry and plaster not infrequently fell on the clergy and congregation to the consternation of both. Probably soon after that date it was abandoned. Some say on account of widespread rumors of it being haunted by the ghost of a nun alleged to have been murdered during the reign of Henry VIII when a convent was either attached to the church or occupied its site. I first heard of the reputed haunting through a photographer living in the neighborhood of Minsden who sent me a photograph taken, he said, in broad daylight at the ruins. The chief interest in the photograph lay in what resembled the shadowy form of a nun. The photographer did not claim he had photographed a ghost. He merely called my attention to the shadowy form and implied he could not account for it. He referred to a local belief in the haunting of the spot by the phantom of a murdered nun and suggested that we should visit the ruins. He would ask a few of his friends to accompany us, and I would invite a few of mine. It was October, and at my suggestion, we chose for the date of our visit to the ruins All Hallows' Eve, that being one of the nights in the year when denizens of the spirit world are popularly believed to be in closest touch with the material inhabitants of this plane. Also, since All Hallows' Eve is one of the occasions when the working of certain spells is deemed likely to produce interesting results, I asked the lady who was well versed in such things to be one of the party. Others I invited were H. V. Morton, the well-known author, Wyndham Lewis, Beachcomber, and R. Blumenfeld, son of the editor of the Daily Express. When I arrived at King's Cross, I saw a crowd of people collected in front of the ladies' waiting room. Intuition warned me of the reason, and when I cautiously elbowed my way through the gaping throng, I perceived as I had anticipated my medimistic friend, clad, and this I had not anticipated, in orthodox witches' costumes, namely high cap, cloak, gown, covered with demons and black cats, and of course in one hand a broomstick. The picture was startling enough, and the expression on the faces of the spectators was a study. While some showed wonder and others amusement, a few looked positively scared. Probably they thought she was the escaped inmate of some home for the mentally defective. Of my three friends, Morton, Wyndham Lewis, and Blumenfeld, there was not a sign. Indeed, I did not see them till I had bundled the witch into a third-class compartment, much to the consternation of a female occupant, who at once flew out of it. I then caught sight of them stealing into a first-class cabin as far away from us as possible. The Hitchin photographer lived with two very proper elderly female relatives, and when they caught sight of the witch, Standing beside me in the doorway, they were immeasurably shocked. Who is this person? they demanded. She must not enter this house. 
and when I endeavored to explain why she had come, their indignation grew. Tom, one of them exclaimed, turning to the photographer who cowered against the wall, looking extremely sheepish and uncomfortable. Tom, you never told us a person dressed like this was coming. It's a scandal. What would your dear father, I, and grandfather say? Why, they never missed a Sunday at chapel in their lives. The mere thought of a woman in such attire as this, pointing at the witch who just stood there calmly and suggested that she was not altogether unaccustomed to such harangues. Coming to the house is enough to make them turn in their graves. Tell her to go away at once. Tom, making no response, I had to intervene, and after much pleading obtained permission for the witch to sit with us in Tom's studio till it was time for us to go to the haunted ruins. On the condition, however, that after leaving the house then, she was never to set foot in it again. The ruins were several miles distant, and it was well nigh midnight when we arrived there. As we drew near to the wood, there was a ghostly rustling of leaves which made the more nervous of the party clutch hold of one another, followed by a buzzing and whirling as a number of birds, scared at our approach, left their home in the ivy-clad ruins of the church and flew frantically away. I had brought with me a variety of articles necessary for the working of the spells, and I proposed that while the witch muttered appropriate incantations, Messiahs Morton, Wyndham Lewis, and Blumenfeld should try their luck with hemp seed and apples. Most all Hallow's Eve keepers know that hemp seed spell. Walking alone in the dark, one has to scatter hemp seed over the left shoulder, drawing mold over it afterwards with a hoe or other instrument, and repeating as one does so these words. Hemp seed I sow, yes, hemp seed I hoe. All those who's to meet me come after me and mow. And then if the powers that govern the unknown ordain it, one hears footsteps in one's rear end on the turning fearfully around sees the immaterial counterpart of whoever is to come into one's life within the next twelve months and affect it most. If you are destined to die during that year, you see a skeleton. All this may sound just fanciful, an old world superstitious tripe, but nevertheless I have known occasions with something quite unexpected and unquestionably superphysical has happened. On this particular occasion when asked if they would separate and alone amid the glooms and shadow of the trees, put the spell to the test, Messiahs Morton, Wyndham Lewis, and Blumenfeld answered in the negative, a very decided negative. They much preferred remaining together. The witch did her best to persuade the ghost to manifest itself. Seated on the damp soil, she crooned and encanted and moaned. There was a note of occasional real misery in the last, but the other world remained obdurate. It would not come at her calling. And perhaps it was just as well, because some of the party might, I think, have been more than a wee bit startled. At least I gathered so much from their close proximity to one another, and from what every now and then sounded suspiciously like the chattering of teeth, though the cold, and out there it was cold, might have something to do with the last. Our pulses gave a sudden jump when one of the party exclaimed, What's that? We looked, and for a few seconds I thought that the witch's endeavors had at last succeeded in bringing the superphysical, but investigation proved it was only the ghostly effect of the moonlight on one of the ivy-clad ruin arches. We were discussing our disappointment, professed disappointment, I fancy, on the part of several when from afar came a sound like the report of a firearm. A strange hour and season for anyone to be out shooting, someone observed, and we thought no more about it. And it was about four o'clock, the chance of the ghost appearing seemed so remote that we set out on our homeward journey, and now came our only real thrill. It was a still gray chilly morning. There had been a slight fog rising from the damp ground around that night, and it was now so thick that those of our party who were in front, myself among them, could not see the witch and photographer who were trudging along some little distance in the rear. Through the mist, the black shades of trees and hedges stood out faintly. We were hastening, thinking longingly of breakfast in a cheery fire, when suddenly dark figures sprang out from seemingly nowhere, and peremptory tones commanded us to halt. They were policemen, four of them, who in the mist, my eyes no doubt, were strained by hours of high nerves tension visual, appeared magnified into giants. They asked what we were doing, tramping a lonely highway, 
at that unearthly hour and when I said, Looking for a ghost? The leader of them responded nastily, That's a good one. You don't expect us to swallow that. He went on to a farmer's at oh, the booking office at Welland Railway Station had been broken into during the night and the official in charge of it fired at, which explained the report of firearms we had heard. He was about to search us and I was feeling somewhat anxious because one of our party had, I knew, a revolver on him when I was seized with a sudden inspiration. Do you know Mr... And I said, naming the local photographer. Well, yes, the sergeant replied, but he's not here. No, I answered, but he's following with a lady clad as a witch and one or two other people. Do you not know last night was All Hallows' Eve? When the dead from crossroads and cemeteries are permitted to mingle once more with the living, we came hoping to see the ghost of the nun that rumor alleges haunts the ruins of Minston Church. Haven't you heard of her? Now I come to think of it, the sergeant said. I have heard of the party, but I don't pay any attention to tales of that sort. You'll have to come along to the police station and answer such questions as may be put to you. Grunts and ejaculations of dismay came from Morton, Wyndham, Lewis, and Blumenfeld, who had hitherto been dumb, too overcome, so I imagine, with the horror of the situation to speak. Now the appalling thoughts of not getting to the respective newspaper headquarters in time loosened their tongue strings, nor did I feel too happy, for as I was cold and shivering and wanted a hot drink very badly. To my infinite relief, however, at this very critical moment, there loomed into view the witch, photographer, and the rest of the party, who were all local. On hearing them corroborate my story, the police sergeant capitulated and all ended well, at least so far as concerned that little incident. But there was some bother when we got back to the photographer's house and tried to smuggle in the witch. One of Tom's elderly relatives hearing us, making sure we were burglars or the house was on fire, started to scream and it took desperate efforts on Tom's part to calm her. Fortunately, she was far too frightened to come out of her bedroom or she must have seen the witch. Our train back to London did not arrive for nearly two hours, and all that time we sat huddled together in a dreary room, a momentary dread of one or other of Tom's aged relatives descending on us. To render the situation more embarrassing and alarming, the witch doubtless affected by sitting on the cold ground for so long, had to retire with sudden haste to the toilet, which, as bad luck would have it, was upstairs next to one of the aged relatives' bedrooms. She contrived to get there without attracting attention, but... On leaving the place, in her anxiety to catch the train, she slipped and, descending amid an avalanche of paper parcels, landed on the floor with a terrific crash. This was altogether too much for Messiahs Morton, Wyndham, Lewis, and Blumenfeld. They decamped pell-mell, meanly leaving me to grab hold of the witch and drag her and her many parcels to the station. So ended my first visit to the haunted church of Minsden. I went there twice afterwards. And on the last occasion, when I was alone, I heard sounds of a very sweet and plaintive music, and thought, just for a moment, I saw a female figure in white standing in one of the archways. It was gone almost at once, and may possibly have been due to a trick of the moonlight.'